Kai. Hi, I'm Justin, and today I'm going to be talking to you about petroleum engineering. And specifically, I'm going to be taking a local aspect of my project. I'm going to be talking about the Marlboro Shale in the Denver Drillsburg Basin. Now, before I begin, I want to put up a little disclaimer. I am just a mere humble student. In fact, I am so humble that I can't afford a $5 million drilling rig. So, what I've been doing for the past six weeks is I've been going to research in the library and reading about discoveries that other drillers and researchers have found before me. I've based my conclusions off what they've said. Here's some questions you might want to ponder when we're going through this presentation. How much oil and natural gas is contained in the DJ Basin? How much oil and natural gas do we as a country import? Can we as a country become the number one producer of oil in the world? Can we be sustainable on our own domestic resources? And what new drilling and extraction methods do we as a country need to exploit if we're going to get all of these resources out of the ground? Here's a little map of the Denver Drillsburg Basin. As I said, it's very big. It covers four states. And I'd like to draw your attention to Colorado. And you can see there's a lot of density for resources up here in the north, over here in the east. Now, if you're an oil driller, it's very important to know what kind of materials are in there. Up to the north, there's a lot of natural gas. Let me put it to you in a ratio. Every barrel of oil you extract is 40 to gallon. You get about 25,000 barrels of natural gas. Whereas over here in the east, you extract one barrel of oil and you might get about three barrels of natural gas. Now we're looking into drilling more in the east because right now, in the oil and natural gas market. Oil is much more expensive than natural gas. It's about $100 a barrel of oil versus, versus about three barrels of natural gas. So it would be clear that we should focus eastern drilling operations. Here are the Rocky Mountains over here. And interestingly, when the mountains were formed and they were pulled up like this, the shale and the water and everything else, all the layers underneath, were also pulled up. Now, shale is a tight, compact rock that's stacked on top of each other like this, and that contains the resources we need. And that explains why there's a lot of drilling activity over here in places like Boulder, because there, the shale is much closer to the surface, and it's easier to extract, whereas, say, here in Greeley, you have to drill about 7,000 feet down before you reach that shale. Area. Let me point out the difference between the Denver Julesburg Basin and the Nalbera Shale, which I've been studying. Denver Julesburg Basin is this whole area here, and the Niobrara is that shale rock, that layer of shale rock that contains all the resources. Just wanted to clear that up, so make sure there isn't any confusion. Here's some facts about the Niobrara Shale. Drilling, drilling started early in the 1900s, and researchers predict that there are about 20,000 naturally occurring oil and natural gas producing wells. Now, the shale rock has low permeability and porosity. Now, what does that mean? It means the shale rock, the layered thin rock, is so tightly compacted that it's really difficult to get the resources out. So difficult, in fact, that sometimes drilling operations need to be extended. And I'll talk about that later. That being said, however, the oil and natural gas reserves are abundant. Researchers predict that there are about 25 to 20 to 75 million barrels of oil within one square mile of the Nabra. Now, of course, that's not, we can't extract all of that. That's a big number. And also, in the whole Niobrara Shale, researchers also predict that there are about 750 billion cubic feet of natural gas contained. It's just a matter of how we're going to get those materials out, which I'm going to talk about later. Now, how did all this oil and natural gas come to Colorado anyway? Well, about 90 million years ago during the late Cretaceous era, there was an inland seaway that extended from the Gulf of Mexico here the Arctic Sea there. Now, the water in this seaway was very shallow. It was about 300 meters deep. And it was very warm. In fact, it was so warm and the living conditions were so favorable that planktonic life overpopulated. As a result of overpopulation, they died and were layered on the ocean floor. Now, as millions of years passed, the, that planktonic life compacted under thousands of layers of sediment. 
and they were exposed to moderate heat and pressure, and the carbon content that was within those organisms was broken down, and the oil and the natural gas held there in place. What kind of organisms are in the inland seaway? We have coccolithic spores. We have phytoplankton. We have diatoms. And of course, our good friend, Sheldon J. Plankton. He was down there. Little known fact. Some facts about the Niobrara Shale. I have a little diagram there, so you can see how far down it really is and how we need to drill. I said before, the organics laid on the ocean floor and were exposed to moderate heat and pressure were trapped under the surface for hundreds of millions of years and the carbon content broke down. That's where the oil is. That's where we have to get it out. How are we going to get it out? Good question. I have a slide that explains new methods of extraction that we as a country need to use in order to get these materials that are thousands of feet below the surface, get them out. Now, the Niobrara extends a lot more horizontally than it does vertically. Because of that, we need to exploit new horizontal drilling methods that I'm going to explain later. As I said before, the shale rock is very compact compared to other shales overseas or in the Middle East. Shale rock is so compact, there's not a lot of frosty, there's not a lot of holes. To, uh, so it's basically a lot of resources very far into the ground under immense pressure. We need to get those out of the surface. In fact, some of the reserves are so difficult to get out that we have to place some oil rigs only a little 15 feet apart in order to get these resources out. So let me talk about horizontal drilling. It's a relatively new method of extraction. You know, Noble Energy has only been using it for four or five years. Basically what happens is you drill down like a typical horizontal well, and then you curve the drill bit and you drill horizontally, thousands of feet. It gives a couple of benefits to this process. You can exploit a lot more oil shale if you use that method because pointing to the typical vertical bore, if we had to check all this material using a vertical bore, might add up to 10, maybe 15 more rigs to the surface. That takes time, that takes money. The two things that are really, really critical to oil companies, they want to save those things. So it's more efficient and there's less intrusion in the surface. We can get a lot more out in a lot less time. It takes about two weeks for this process to happen. Another thing drillers like to exploit is hydraulic fracturing. What happens is that once you get that horizontal well drilled, you pump a mixture of sand, water and chemicals in the earth at really high pressure and you cause these fractures to open here. Fractures about a few feet of penetration. Once you get those fractures, you pump a gelatinous fracturing fluid into those cracks at high pressure again. And it goes in as a gelatinous mixture, but over the process of drilling, the two weeks that I explained, it actually turns back into a liquid form. So it's easy to extract, and once it is extracted, they send the material off to refineries because the fracturing fluid has absorbed the oil and natural gas that we need to extract, send it off to refineries, and then it's sorted and mixed back into the different components that we need. Now the whole point of my project was to explain how much oil and natural gas is in the Niobrara, and once we figure that out, how sustainable would that be, and how long could we last on our domestic oil reserves? Well, here's a chart of gas production and oil production in Colorado. And as you can see, about 1990s, gas production increases exponentially, and then it tapers off around here in 2012. Now, I think that's due to the fact that oil is a lot more expensive than natural gas, and because of that, we're trying to exploit more oil than natural gas. Remember that $100 a barrel to $3 a barrel thing? I want to point your attention to the oil production graph. You can see there's some increase, some steady increase, but then between 2008 and 2010, of course, there was a financial crisis. But we see that the slope increases, and we're drilling more, and we're extracting more from the earth. That's odd, I think. You would think that a country in, in 
a sort of financial depression would lower the drilling restrictions. But instead, it increases. And I think that's because in 2008, there were some drilling restrictions that were lifted, natural parks and overseas and whatnot. So basically, we were, drillers were allowed to drill more in the Narbara Shale. So is the Narbara sustainable? I define sustainability as the amount of energy that is produced by the resources is equal to the extraction energy uh, added to the amount of energy we consume. As I said, there, there's a lot of resources in the Navarre Shale, and Colorado as a state produces about 7% of the natural gas that we use. Let's talk about the global energy market, see if we could really be sustainable. We produce about 30% of our energy or oil that we consume, and we import 70% from Canada and Mexico and overseas. That's a lot of importing oil. Now let me turn your attention to natural gas. We produce about 90% of the natural gas we use domestically. We import or drill overseas to the other 10%. Now, off of my, based off of my research and what I found, I think that as we progress through the 21st century, and we rely more on energy, I think that more that inevitably more drilling restrictions will be lifted. And I think that 90% get up to 100, and we wouldn't need to import any sort of oil or, I'm sorry, import any sort of natural gas or anything like that. And we can become sustainable on our own natural gas reserves. Now let's talk about the oil market. Saudi Arabia is the greatest producer of oil followed by Russia and the United States in third. We trail Russia by about 100,000 barrels of oil to today. Now, it could be possible, I think, to surpass Russia because we're so close to them, but I think realistically, it's not possible to surpass Saudi Arabia and global oil production, especially if we're importing so much. Now, why do I think that? Well, in Saudi Arabia, they don't get oil from shale. In fact, they get oil from sandstone, which is much more permeable. And it's easier to extract those resources. And because of that, they don't have to invest their time and money into horizontal drilling methods like we in the United States have to, and they rely mostly on vertical techniques. So in conclusion, I really think that although it would be nice for us to be sustainable or become the number one in the world, I don't think it's possible because our extracting methods take longer, and they need more time, investment, and whatnot. And before I conclude, I'd like to acknowledge some of my sponsors. I'd like to thank Chesapeake Energy and the Kinder Morgan Foundation for their generous donations and allowing me to participate in this amazing program. I'd also like to thank Noble Energy and Nalco for graciously allowing me to visit their oil drilling site. Because normally I'm in the library doing research, but thanks to the generous donations, the generous opportunities these two companies provided me, I was able to leave the library for two days and go out and exploit oil fields and really see how the drilling process works. It was really exciting. All the people who worked with me were really informative, really knowledgeable, and I had a great time doing that. I'd also like to thank everyone at the Frontiers of Science Institute and the NASA office, and Lori Ball. Everyone here did such a great job making sure that I got the most out of this opportunity and giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it because I learned so much this summer and it would have, and it's so, it's worth so much more to me than just sitting home all day, reading or watching TV. I'd like to thank all the teachers who took time out of their summers to graciously teach me what they knew, new things in science. I'd like to thank the RAs for making my stay at the dorms and on campus very nice. <laughs> I'd also like to thank my mentor, Nick Orianopoulos, for coming to me all the time, giving his great, his vast amount of knowledge about drilling to me, always being there for me, reading my paper 50 times, even though <laughs> he only wanted to do it five, I'm sure. Right? <laughs> Thanks, Nick. It really means a lot to me that you put all this time and effort. And I wish you the best. Thank you.